Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Well, hello everybody and welcome to another presentation in the series of Troubleshooting with Fusion Reactor. Part three today will be on when, when requests are slow for less obvious reasons. And I'll explain some context for that in case any of you are coming here for the first time. We'll talk about what we did in parts one and two to give you some perspective. So my name is Charlie Earhart and I'm an independent consultant at carehart.org. And I just focus on server troubleshooting. And I help people use Fusion Reactor every day. So I don't work for Integral, the company that makes Fusion Reactor, but I do work with them. I love giving these webinars. I do consulting with them and troubleshooting for clients challenges that they have and uh, they've always been very responsive to suggestions for feedback for the product so I really enjoy working with them great guys and ladies and I'm very happy to uh, represent them today and telling you more about Fusion Reactor. So what we're going to do today is pretty much all demos but I'll just tell you we're going to talk a bit about a couple things and then we're going to dive into these topics of using Fusion Reactor and if they as their words don't make sense don't worry I'll help you to understand what they mean but we'll talk about stack tracing and why that's important and when it's valuable profiling requests similarly the CPU sampler feature and memory profiler now let me just say up front that if those last three things don't sound familiar to you that's because they're relatively new things and that may be part of the reason why you don't recognize them it will explain why they're all valuable, and then we'll end by talking about what's coming up in part four. And as always, I'd like to end with resources from, for learning more and have time for questions and answers. And I'll keep an eye on the questions as we go. Um, in fact, if somebody could just send in a comment just in the next five seconds, if one person <laughs> who hears me could put a question in just to say we hear you. It's just unusual to have absolutely no interaction. I want to make sure you guys are hearing me. And that all's well. Just somebody type something into the. There you go. Thank you. That's enough. Nobody else needs to say anymore. <laughs> all right. Cool. Thank you. All right. So let's get going. So as I said, this is part three of what has been planned to be a four-part series. The first part was troubleshooting what's just happened on my server, and we talked about characteristics of Fusion Reactor that help with understanding that. Then the next part was why are requests or transactions running slowly, and I'll talk a bit more about what those were in a moment just to give you perspective. And then the next part, the final part, will be post-crash post -crash troubleshooting. So all very important things, all have very different purposes, all can help you with different aspects of your problems, and that's why you should really understand these four key things before you get started. We do presume that you're already using Fusion Reactor. It's okay if you haven't yet used it. You'll still get value out of this by seeing what's possible with it. But the point is a lot of people who've been using it for a long time are often overwhelmed. It's just such a rich product with so many features and buttons and places to go look in. And sometimes it's not even obvious to you how to connect the dots. And the docs help you. If you would read the documentation, you might find things would become much more clear, but you know, who reads the docs, right? You'd hope that the interface is just clear enough. And I hope by introducing these things to you as I have and will, that you will go, oh yeah, that is pretty obvious. Once you've been, you know, it's kind of like taking you through a guided tour of the city. You know, sometimes you just need to have that first tour of the city to see, okay, that's over there, this is over there, I got it, I can, I can do this on my own now. And these concepts I'm going to talk about apply pretty much to any Java or CFML server that Fusion Reactor can monitor. And so if you didn't know, Fusion Reactor is not just for Cold Fusion, for those that use Cold Fusion. It can be used with Lucy, Blue Dragon, it can be used with Tomcat and WebSphere and WebLogic and JBoss, everything, Wildfly, Glassfish, Jetty. So finally, these presentations are all being recorded. The ones that have been recorded are available online already. But the point is, is this one today, if I go over something that you missed, don't worry about it. You can watch the recording and catch up with later. Maybe just take note what time it is when you have that question, and you can quickly go to YouTube and catch up to the point that's of interest to you. And then finally, before we go ahead, I want to point out that if you didn't catch this news, Fusion Reactor 8 was released last week, and it's got some interesting new features. I'm not today going to talk about anything that's new in 8, so don't worry about that. And even the interface I'm going to show you at least on my site, is currently Fusion Reactor 7, like I assume it is for most of you. Uh, I'll show the demo website that is running on 8, so if you want to see what it looks like and maybe find out some of the new changes. But really, there's a, a, a tech note for Fusion Reactor 8, so if you just want to find out what's new in 8, just Google Fusion Reactor 8. It'll be taken to the tech note, and you can read about what's new. And expect to see blog posts and eventually future webinars covering it as well. So quickly, just to recap, 
because some of you may be coming to this presentation for the first time, not having seen the other two. I just want to explain that I said at the beginning of the first one, you just want to be careful always not to presume that you know what's going wrong because often your presumptions are wrong and it leads you to look in the wrong places and be left thinking you don't can't find the answer. So I showed how with Fusion Reactor you can quickly and easily see what's going on currently and recently, and especially by the web metrics feature. That's the thing I would say to look at first and foremost, learn what that's about, keep an eye on that, know what's normal, and then deal with when things are not normal. And then I talked about using the requests page feature so you could look at what requests were running, and then the history of the 100 most recent requests, the 100 most recent that were slow, and the 100 slowest of all since your instance had come up. And then the error history page feature that lets you focus on errors if that's your focus. I also talked about how Fusion Reactor does track CPU and memory usage and garbage collection. So those are all things covered in the first part. Then in the second part, I talked about transactions, and mostly that's about JDBC transactions, HTTP client or CFHTTP, and other kinds of transactions. And you can track those also as they're running over history, slow, longest, and across all apps, as opposed to within a particular request. So those things often will be helping you find out why things are slow. But the problem is sometimes they don't. And that's what we're gonna do today is move on to what can you do when those are not the reason for the slowness? What other features are available? And that includes seeing low level JVM details, which may seem confusing if you ever tried it for the first time. But again, I hope to help you see that it's really not that difficult to understand once you know what you're looking at. And you can use these features in some ways with running requests and in some ways with finished requests. And then we'll talk also about, well, what if it's not about requests, but it's about high CPU and maybe some thread in the background that you're not even expecting is slow? Or what if it's about memory and you're wondering what objects are using memory? There's ways to see those things, yes, with Fusion Reactor. So let's go ahead and get going. So first we'll talk about stack tracing. So let me flip over to, <clears throat> excuse me, my server. So this is my careheart.org server. And I'm just using it as a demo. It's running all the time. It doesn't have particularly uh, valuable, interesting stuff on it. So I don't have a lot of requests. This is the web metrics page. It is interesting for me to look and see that at the moment I've got something on my server that's using CPU that's not my instance of cold fusion. That's the dark yellow. I've got something in the background using CPU. I, I won't, well, actually, let me show you really quick. I didn't show this when I showed the demo last week. One of the, or, uh, part one, um, one of the nice things in Fusion Reactor Ultimate, and I believe it's in the Enterprise Edition as well. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll down. My mouse isn't cooperating. Is under System Resources. This isn't what I was going to talk about today, but as long as we're seeing that problem, let me just show you. Under System Resources, if you're on Enterprise or above, I believe, you'll see Processes. And that is like looking at Top in Linux or Task Manager in Windows. And this is showing all the processes currently running on the machine, and then it's gonna show it in reverse descending order by CPU. So this would often be helpful, and at the moment, it does say my cold fusion is 48%, but I'm sure that's gonna refresh in a moment, and it's not. So there's something else. Now you may notice that there's only three things listed. Well, that's something I want some of you to be aware of. If you've changed, in my case, it's Windows. If I've got my Windows service running as a user who has limited permissions, to certain directories and folders, well, by default, this mechanism can only see the processes running by that user. So somebody might have thought this would have been the answer, but since I have a limited functionality user running my cold fusion, I can't see processes that I don't own. So I would have to go remote onto the server to be able to see that. So, you know, it, that may help some of you if you're not using such a limited user, but in my case, I realize now I couldn't take advantage of it. But it's, you know, up and down. It'll probably settle down. It doesn't really matter for what we're dealing with. So let's move on. So what's the point of what I'm talking about with stack tracing? So if a request was running slow, then while it was running slow, if I wanted to know why it was running slow, I could stack trace it. Now, I don't currently have any running slow, and I don't know if during the session one will happen, but I'm going to take you to the demo site instead. And here's the demo site. And in the demo site, you can see that there are occasionally long running requests. And I want to repeat that if I want to know why those requests were slow, I would normally go to requests, slow requests. I would find one of the slow requests. And again, my, I think my browser is not responding quickly because you know, Fusion Reactor is usually instant on that. But so here's requests that have run slow. And so happens that these are all getting 500. So I don't know if this is going to be useful, but 
let's say I wanted to know why was this request slow. Well, I said in part two, what you were in part one and two, I repeated that you want to go into the request, look at the details of it, or click this little button. Either one will get you to the details for this request. And before you dig any further, just look down here and say, what's the total query total time? And is it equal to the total execution time? In this case, it is. So I don't need to do anything like stack trace it to find out why it's slow. It's slow because of a query. And I can see that query here. So then again, that's stuff from part one and part two. But let's say the problem wasn't that and we couldn't understand what it was. And by the way, I, I should back up and say that if the request was slow because of HTTP processing, that would have been something I would have seen in the relations. I'm going to go back into the details of this request and I'm going to ask to look at the relations. Come on. Wait. Again, I, I don't I think this is something on the network because it's all usually very fast. This is a remote server, remember, this is not local to me. So anyway, there's a, here's this relations tab. So instead of JDBC, relations. And if I am doing something like an HTTP client request or a CF HTTP request, and it was taking a long time, I would see that. In this case, it's just the web request, which happened to be spring, it's a Java request. And most of it was this JDBC request. That's the time spent. But I'm saying you might see, oh, it was a CF HTTP or an HTTP client. And then down here, you would see the URL being called if it was a CF HTTP, that's part one, part two stuff. But if it's not those things, then I'm saying, well, how do you find out where the time is being spent? So first I'm gonna show you, let's say we're on looking at the request activity when there is a slow request. And I'm gonna change this to sorted by time. So the slowest are at the top, so I can readily see it. And I'm gonna tell it to refresh about every two seconds. And so here's the thing, this is the, this is the cool stuff. If you guys come in and you see a bunch of requests running and you, want, and, and you want to know what they are, you should click on them, look and see if it's a query, look and see if it's a relation. But my point is, let's say you've done that and it's not. Now, none of these are lasting long enough for me to do that, but let's say I did that and it wasn't JDBC and it wasn't anything in the relations and I'm wondering, well, why are you slow? This will be more valuable when it's been running for a long, long time, but I'll wait till one's running for about three to five seconds. And when it pops up here, the buttons over here, the third button is gonna be what's called the stack trace button. So again, these are just automatic transactions running in a moment. We'll see one that will take long. It usually doesn't take very long before we see one. I'm saying in your case, you would be coming here and seeing there's a bunch of slow ones, but I'm waiting for this artificial load to create one. And this third, the second, in this case, second button on this interface, it's the second button. So I'll just wait. I don't want to just click it as soon as it comes up. And I want to tell you that do not use this feature to look at a request that just pops up in the running request page, because by the time you click it, it could be finished. I want to wait and see if after two seconds, is it still running? And if it is, then as soon as I see it's longer than two seconds, then I'm going to stack trace it and say, well, what are you doing? And the point is, I can say this while we're waiting, it's going to say to the JVM, hey, what are you doing? You request that's running. Tell me from a JVM perspective, what are you doing? And it'll tell me down to the line of code what it's doing. And if it's in Cold Fusion, it'll be the CFM line of code. If it's Java, it'll be a JSP or servlet line of code. And it's funny, <laughs> isn't that the thing, you know, sometimes you're, you're watching stuff and it doesn't happen. It was previously happening every couple seconds that there was a long running request. And I'm really shocked that suddenly there's not. And I'll tell you what, rather than wait for that, I'm going to just go create an artificial uh, load. Let me do that in a another window. Just give me a second. Sorry for that. I really thought that would much it will happen while I'm not looking. Okay, so I'm about to kick off an artificially long running request against my server. And we'll go back to that in just a moment to see it happening. And I'll make it run for 50 seconds. Okay, so now if we come back to my server, and first you'll see there starts to be a running request. Second, this average response time of running request is gonna to start to increase and increase and increase. That tells me, oh, I've got a long running request. That's cool to remember. Then if I go to request activity, 
there will be any requests that are running slow. And if you have lots of requests running, you might want to do this of so sorting it by time. So the slowest one is at the top and other ones are popping up below it. And you want to focus on that. And I'm saying you should go into it and say, is it a long running query? Is it a long running relation? But let's say you found out that it wasn't. Well, that's where this button, the stack trace button right there, you mouse over it, it pops up and says stack trace. When I click on that, it says to the JVM, all right, thread that's running this request, what are you doing? <clears throat> so this is the thread that's running. That's not important really for you to know for now. This is the request that was running. That's what matters. And this is what that request was doing at that moment. Now, at first you look at this and go, that looks like gibberish. I don't know what to make of that. But the good news is that almost always on this page, if you just look down without scrolling, here you can see on my page, there's the reference to the CFM page, in my case, Skull Fusion page, it's running. And it's literally line 23 that's running. This is not lying. This is not like other things that sometimes tell you a number and it's not the right number. No, this is exactly the line of code that's running. This was running line 23 of, in my case, long DB wait, which you can tell is I artificially created a slow request. Now, more importantly, not only can I see it is line 23, but I could say to myself, well, how long has it been doing that? Now, if I refresh this now, I said it's only run for 50 seconds. And it's going to tell me, oh, the request is finished. So you don't want to look at this pro this uh, stack trace once it's finished, because now it's moved on. This thread could be running some other request. It has nothing to do with the request we were looking at. But let me do it again <clears throat> and make a different point. Okay, there it goes, kicked off again. And I'll back up and we'll see that there is that long running request. Now it's only several seconds old. I'm going to stack trace it and I'm going to say, okay, what are you doing? And again, we're going to see. There you go. So it says it's line 23 again. But my point is, OK, yeah, we get that it's line 23. Yeah, we get that it's exactly in that template folder. That's great. But is it really doing that? Because if I hit refresh right now, it's about 10 seconds later. Well, sure enough, it is. So now I know that at least for 10 seconds, it's been doing that. You know, I could surmise that it's been doing that for 10 seconds. Not exactly true, but I could surmise it's been at least for 10 seconds. I do it again. Sure enough, it's still there. It's been like 25 seconds. So I could say to myself, well, this does look like it's stuck doing that. Now, here's where I could go look at that code and find out what is line 23. But the really cool thing is I just look up here. And this generally tells me. So that turned into the stuff above that. And it was a query tag, do end tag. So in Cold Fusion, those that do CFML, Cold Fusion, Lucy, Rilo, Blue Dragon, it's a closing CF query tag. That's literally telling me that line 23 is a closing CF query tag. And that doesn't mean finish the query and move on, it means execute the query. And you read these from top up, and sure enough, that turned into start query, execute query, execute, 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 blah, 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 SQL Server, blah, blah, blah. This is the stuff that that got turned into. So all this at the top is what this line is doing under the covers from a Java perspective. And at the moment, I caught it doing this. And every time I refreshed it, it was doing this. And what this is is saying, yes, this CF query in my case, or could be a CF stored prod, could be a CF ATP, whatever, it's waiting for the network to respond with whatever I asked for. In my case, I asked for a query. I'm waiting for the query to respond. That's literally what it's doing. So I can tell even, and, and again, I didn't need to do this if it was a query. I would have looked at the details and it would have said it was running a query. But if it wasn't running a query, if it was a, a network file system write or read, I could see that it was hung up doing a network file system reader write. I'd see, oh, it's a CF file tag or a CF directory tag or some function or tag that talks to the operating system. And maybe it's a, a SAN or a NAS or a share or, or a UNC path, and it's waiting for that. So isn't that cool? You can see down to the line of code. Well, it gets even better. In more recent versions of Fusion Reactor, not only can you see this, and you could go look at the file, but check this out. See this blue over here? That's the underlying Java class that your CFML, in the case of Cold Fusion, got turned into. Same with the JSP, it would be turned into an underlying servlet class. Anyway, this is the underlying Java class, and you may go, I can't do anything with that. And you're right, you can't, but look what Fusion Reactor does. If I click on this, it shows me the CFML. Ah, okay. So it's turned off to not be do doable over an external web server. So this is my remote Carehart server. That's not here where I am. I can't do that here. But if you were in your work environment and you were looking at your local Fusion Reactor, yeah, if you click that link, you would see your CFML code, literally see the CFML code 
every line of it would be presented in here with line numbers to make it really easy and with color coding to make it easy. So again, that's by clicking on this right here to the left of the file name, you can see the actual source code. And that would have just for me confirmed, yes, it was a CF query. Now I see a couple of questions coming up um, and I see the one about the process view that wasn't too helpful in Docker. I appreciate that. And again, um, if you have a concern about that, take that up with the support folks, support at fusion-reactor.com. They might have us an answer for you. Then somebody said that makes me wonder if there are any other things in Fusion Earth that might be misleading when it's running in a container. For instance, I'm curious how you would even calculate the dark yellow CPU in a container context. Again, an excellent question. Can CPU use within containers and within virtual machines are things that vary based on the operating system, based on the version of Docker. So I'll just say there's probably no universal answer to that. But again, take that sort of question to the support folks and they'll talk about it in the context of your specific operating system, your specific version of Docker. So do take that up with them. All right, so that's stack tracing. Pretty cool to be able to see down to the line of code what a thing is doing. And I'll just say <clears throat> that this same approach of using this thing to say what's going on in a request that's running now can also be used, and we'll talk about this in the last part four, two weeks from now, when you're looking at an alert that's been generated by Fusion Reactor, it provides a stack trace of all the running requests at the time of the alert. And you would use the same approach to look for each request that's running, look for its thread and say, well, what does its stack trace say it's doing? And then you might find that all the requests are stuck doing something. I've seen all kinds of things. And that's all I wanna say is, you never know what the problem may be. If it's not a query, if it's not a relation like a CF HTTP, then you wanna use a stack trace and say, well, what the heck are you doing? And you want to see if it's tending to be stuck doing that thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get a drink of water. Okay, <clears throat> so no questions, <clears throat> no more questions. Excuse me. So let's move on. So that's stack tracing. Pretty cool stuff. Turning this on its head is profiling. Profiling is a kind of a twist on <clears throat> stack tracing. So with stack tracing, we need to be doing that with the request while it's running. It doesn't do any good to look at a profile, sorry, at a stack trace when the request is finished. Because as you saw, it pops up and says this thread is finished. You can't stack trace it. So then what do you do when you've got ones that have run? Well, let's go look at my requests, slow requests, for example. We talked about this last time. And these are the 100 most recent requests that were slow. For me, slow is greater than four seconds. I've changed it. For you, by default, it would be eight seconds, and that's configurable under the request settings. But anyway, <clears throat> here are requests that were slow, and I'm going to pick one randomly that has been a particularly long time and say, why were you so slow so so far? Nothing's really been more than 10 seconds. Well, here's something that was 16 seconds. It's not you know terrible, but Again, what I remind you is I first want to look at the request. You either click on the details or click on the URL, look at it <clears throat> and say, well, of these 16 seconds, was it query time? And again, in this case, yes, it was. But if I had one that wasn't, and if it wasn't in relations, and it's not, but if it weren't, then I'd be wondering, well, where did you spend your time? And even though this is not one that I don't understand, it's query, let me still show you what the profiler would show you. So you see there's a link for profiler. So first, this is only in requests that have finished. Second, it's only in requests that have been slower than by default three seconds. Third, this is only in the ultimate edition of Fusion Reactor. So if you're looking at Fusion Reactor Standard or Enterprise, you won't see this. And also, I think it's as of Fusion Reactor 7 or 6. But anyway, so this will be something to consider if you don't have ultimate, this is a reason to consider getting it. The stack tracing is everything, all versions, but the profiler is in ultimate only. So first of all, notice there's also a link under here for Profiler, but I'm on the details, there's a link under here for Profiler. And in fact, if I back up, whenever I'm looking at a list of requests, if it's been more than three seconds, there's a link to the Profiler. So all of them would go to the same place, whether I click on that link or I go into the details and click on either of these links, they all go to this. This is the Profile. So let me just tell you quickly what the Profile is and then we'll look at figuring out what it, you know, how do we use it. The Profile is Fusion Reactor taking stack traces for you. And by default, it takes them every 200 milliseconds once a request is more than three seconds old. So Fusion Reactor starts taking stack traces every 200 milliseconds for as long as the request runs. So since this was 16 seconds old, then starting at about three seconds, it went for about 12.8 more seconds to calculate a total of 38 samples. 
so it took 38 stack traces. And by the way, let me be clear so nobody thinks, oh, this is shocking. It's going to tear my server apart. No, it's not. Guess what? This is on by default. If you have ultimate, this is on by default. Every request and every thread is profiled. And you might think, oh, that's crazy. These guys are nuts. No, no, no. This is all designed to be very lightweight. You should not notice any impact from this. So I know somebody's thinking, well, that's, that, this is what's killing our server. I'm telling you, no, it's not. But anyway, if you could somehow prove that it was, you could take it to the support folks and they would want to fix it. But I promise you, if you're on a modern version of Fusion Reactor, anything even in later versions of 7, there, I've not heard of any problem related to the profiler. And so certainly if you're on a later version, don't even worry about that unless you've got some weird problem that nobody's ever reported before. Anyway, moving on. So it took these 38 samples during these 12 seconds. And here's the important part. It, it kind of pivoted all those and said, well, where was the most time spent? So if you look over here, it says, okay, well, for the 12 seconds I was profiling, 100% of the time was doing these things. Well, that's obvious. Everything's underneath it. And 100% was these things. That's interesting. And there's 88% was these things and 11% was these things. And it says 11.3 was this and 1.4 was that. And adds up almost to 12.8. It's just under. It's, you know, it's 88 and 11, not 88 and 12. So it's not showing actually every single thing, but the big things. It's focusing on what are the big things. And frankly, I want to focus on where's the 88% being spent. And here it is. And it's what we saw before. When it's a query, it's really going to be spending most of its time waiting for that query. And this is just telling us that, yes, for, and this isn't the request we were looking at. This was another request. But I saw that it was slow because of queries. So this doesn't surprise me. It spent 88% of its time in that method saying, I'm waiting for the result of the query. Now, you wouldn't look at that and know it's a query. I realize that. You wouldn't know that. The way Fusion Reactor is done things is it's trying to collapse it. So if that's enough, you're done. But if you need to know more, it often collapses these things, and you can click Show, and now it'll expand and show me all of the Java methods that led to that thing down there, socket read zero. And in this case, it's read from top down. And so if we read from the bottom up, that was called by this, which was called by that, and it's looking exactly like what we saw in the stack trace, all the way up to the execute, SQL query, cold fusion tag, uh, end tag right there, query tag, do end tag, and it was in my blog CFC. Now, it doesn't tell me the line number. This is important to hear this. It doesn't tell me the line number because this is not a stack trace of a point in time saying what was it doing at that time. This is a profile saying of those 38 samples, where was the time spent? And so that query function could be called from this line of code, could be called from other lines of code. So just for the moment, just let it go. Just the point is we can tell without question it was doing query processing. We don't know if it was one query or 100 queries. That we can't tell. But it did do this method, this, this CFC, and this method of the CFC for sure. And that was a query in there. <clears throat> and that query took all this time. So that's the way you read a profile. And again, I wouldn't do this with a query. That's a painful way to look and find out, oh, it was all slow queries. I could have found that out in the details of the request. But it's when you don't know what the request is doing and it's run long in the past and you wonder why that you can look at this and figure it out. So that's the profiler. Really very cool. And really not much more to say about that uh, other than to say that if you are either concerned about it or want to tweak it, there is profiler. Here's profiler settings. So you could go in there and tweak when does it start profiling at three seconds? How often does it do it? 200 milliseconds. Is it enabled by default? Yes. If you want to turn it off, you can. And by the way, I didn't say this, but it only tracks it for up to 60 seconds by default. So you might want to tell it to go longer or go shorter. But anyway, that's profiling. And you can see profiles that have been done in the past, not by looking at the request history, but also by looking at the profiler history. And it's just, again, for me, all requests. And this duration, by the way, is not how long the request took, it's how long the profile took. So I can say this must have taken 49 seconds, and this must have taken exactly three seconds. And it was three seconds old, and it started profiling it, and only got one profile. And that's what this is. How many samples did it take? This one took 200 samples. This one took one sample. Okay? And then this would be to go look at that profile, which won't be interesting for that one. Um, and I don't see any others that are interesting to me. But one last thing I'll say is that I'm showing it for requests, but let, hear me, this is important. This also shows the 100 most recent profiles of any kind of thread. 
So if you did have some other kind of thread that was taking time and it wasn't a request thread, so it wasn't showing up in the request page, but it was some other kind of thread, that would be listed in here. This shows whatever threads. So there's the thread names. There would be the name of the thread and what application it's in. <clears throat> so anyway, that's profiling. Really cool stuff. Now, <clears throat> let's say the problem, so you understand we're peeling the onion. In the first two parts, we had long running requests. We don't know why they were running. In this one, last two things we talked about, we had slow long running requests and we wanna know what are they doing if it's something unusual or if they're finished, what were they doing? What if you have a problem where the CPU is high and and right now the, the CPU of your instance, if it's high and yet there's no request running, that'll be a stumper, right? Because you're like, well, if it's not running any requests, I don't know why it's high. And if it's not running any requests, I can't dig into them to find out what they're doing. <clears throat> That's where this sampler feature comes in. It lets you look at what threads are using high CPU. So let's take a look at that. Again, I don't have that problem on my server. In fact, let's just see if right now, even if I have that non-CF CPU running high. No, so whatever it was, it settled down. And it could have been anything. Could have been a uh, antivirus scan in the background. It could have been a security update in the background. It could have been my browser restarting because of update or who knows. But the point is it's gone for the most part. Anyway, we're not talking about the non-CF CPU, hear me. What I'm about to show you has nothing to do with the non-instance CPU. We're talking about the instant CPU. And if it was high, if you came in here and said this was high, and by high, I'd mean 20%, 50%, 70%. And yeah, even sometimes for some people, 20% would be high. For me, it would be unusual to be constantly even 20%. I'd be worried about that. And if there were no running requests, if this didn't show any running, this didn't show any running, I'd be like, hmm, why would the CPU be high when there's nothing running? So if that happens to you, then I'm saying you'd want to go to this profiler CPU sampler. So again, profiler only in Ultimate and later versions of Fusion Reactor, I think seven and above. So you may not see the profiler button, but here again is a reason to consider getting it. If you've got such CPU problems, there are certain features that are added to the Ultimate Edition to give value to those added features. You know, that's just a lot of products do that. They hold certain features in the higher versions. Anyway, so you click on Profiler CPU Sampler. And what this does is it says, okay, <clears throat> here's all the threads. These are the thread names. And they're in descending order of how much CPU you've, they've used. Now, you might look at this and go, whoa, Charlie, isn't that some embarrassing? Fusion Reactor is using the most CPU. Well, time out. Let me say two things. One, this is since my instance came up. Or since I... Uh, took what's called a snapshot. So first of all, I wouldn't be surprised that most of my requests, these are, and, and let me say the second thing, which is these, in the case of Cold Fusion 10 and above and Lucy, typically you're gonna see AJP requests. This is the Tomcat web connector. So Tomcat receives the requests for either Cold Fusion or for Lucy or Blue Dragon. Uh, not Blue Dragon, sorry, uh, or Rylo. Typically, these people have Tomcat. Cold Fusion comes with Tomcat under the covers, and it's a Tomcat connector between, say, IIS or Apache or Nginx. People often use HJP connectors for that. You might have an HTTP thread here instead, but let's not focus on that. The point is, whatever kind of things you receive, you'll have a thread for those things you receive. And these were, over the life of CF, in my case, this thread has used the most CPU other than this one. Well, this is every different request that's run has run on one of these threads and they get reused. So I've probably run 50,000 requests on this thread since my instance came up. And I've maybe run 49,998 on this one and 49,997 on this one. So the point is don't worry about the thread names per se. What I'm trying to say is that those threads, they were using the most CPU other than this one well, they don't do much. In my case, my requests don't use a lot of CPU. Therefore, that's why they show up not using a lot of CPU. And you might say, well, that's a lot of Fusion Reactor CPU. And I'll say, well, it is relative to my server because my requests don't use a lot of CPU. But I'm telling you, in your server, you might see this looking very different. You might see this doesn't even show up on the list and all of your threads do. And more importantly, listen, more importantly, you may see threads you don't recognize. Yours may not be AJP threads. They may be CF thread threads. 
They may be some weird background Java uh, thread doing something that you didn't even know was happening. So you want to look at what it is. That's the point. So for the moment, let this go that this is at the top. I would even say when you first come to this, as interesting as it might be to say, well, what's it been like since it came up? Heck, it could have come up days ago. Look at mine. It came up 16, February 16th. Mine's been up for 12 days. I don't really care about this so much, what's going on for 12 days. I want to know what's going on now. So check this out. If I click deltas, deltas, that changes things. That says, okay, wipe out the prior metrics. And from this point forward, how much time is being spent? So notice that now the time is when I just did the delta, 936, 29. And this is now refreshing. And so now I'm seeing so far about 20 seconds. So over the past 20 seconds, well, there's a, and again, it's popping around. I wouldn't focus on what happened in 20 seconds, but let's say after a minute, it might be interesting to see. Well, after that minute, well, where has the time been spent? Now, again, in my case, my requests don't do much. So I'm not surprised that my CF requests are low and other things are higher. I'm not worried. I don't have high CPU. Remember, I don't have high CPU. So this may be the highest using CPU, but I'm not worried about it. So let's not overfocus on it. You may see something very different. You may see some particular thread come up. And if it's these kind of threads, I'll just say, okay, you got a long running request that's using CPU. You go back to request activity and look at that request. <laughs> that's, but I'm saying, what if it's not that? Okay, if there's no running requests and yet you do have high CPU, what could be that cause? And I couldn't even think of a way to artificially make it happen. So I haven't done that, but you may see something very different. So the point is now we're looking at about a minute and a half and your look may be very different here. And this is by the total percent of CPU time. Now, if it was some thread that you didn't understand, here's the point. Listen, if it was some thread you didn't understand and it was increasing in the CPU as you're watching with these deltas enabled, you might wonder, well, what is that thing doing, right? And if it's a thread that's not a request thread, we can't look at request details. And, and if it's not a transaction, we can't look at the transactions. So what do we do? Well, we can stack trace it. Check this out. Look, everything over here. We can stack trace this. Now, it's not going to be interesting for me to stack trace this, but I'm just going to do it to show you that it can be done. So I click on that button, and it's literally stack trace that thread and said, what are you doing? And it looks like it's running some sort of um, drift awareness thing that, you know, it's not important to me. It's a metrics gatherer. It's doing what it does. It gathers metrics. And at the moment, it was doing that. And remember, that's just at that moment. I'll hit refresh. Could be moved on to doing something different. Or it could be that it's always doing that. And I would just say, I'm not worried about that. I don't care about that. But you may be seeing something different when you do it, okay? So that's that. <clears throat> and let's connect the dots. Maybe you'd say, well, okay, I can look at a point in time, but I'd really like to see what does it spend most of its time doing, like over 10 seconds. And I'm just going to pick a different one to be a little more interesting, like this. So again, remember, this is a HTTP thread, a given HTTP thread. It, uh, AJP thread in my case, as I refresh it, <clears throat> as different requests run on it, we're going to eventually see that it starts doing something relative to the requests that come in, run on it, and leave. So it's interesting that I've been refreshing it, nothing's happened. Again, my server's pretty low um, activity, but you might see something different. The point is, remember, we're talking about <clears throat> if this was a thread you didn't understand, and it's been running CPU for a long time, and you wanted to know what has it been doing, and a stack trace is just a point in time, I could click profiler. I'm going to go ahead and do it. It's not probably going to be useful, but I've just clicked it. It says start profiling the thread, and it puts this little box there. And by the way, if you hadn't noticed, when you're looking at request activity, if you have a long-running request, and I'll go ahead and kick that one in the background just to explain what that box is about. So now I've got a long-running request in the background, and it'll pop up on the screen in a moment. There you go. And so I'll set this to refresh. And what I want you to notice is that once this long running request has exceeded, in my case, those three seconds, it's got that red box as well. This is telling me it is being profiled. Again, ColdFusion profiles request automatically after three seconds. This is telling me it is being profiled. And after 60 seconds, because it's set to stop it after 60 seconds, this will go off, but it'll still be running if it's still running. And also look up here, this icon tells me that I've got something being profiled. But remember, we were back on the sampler, and I had said to profile a thread, and it's telling me, yep, I'm profiling it. And two, I could see, yes, it's being profiled. Something's being profiled. And it did stop 
profiling it after those 60 seconds. So I can go to the profiler history profile. Remember, we said profile, profile, history. And now I should see that fusion reactor. There it is. So it's not an AJP thread like all the others. It's this one. I chose to profile it. It shows up in the list. It was profiled for 60 seconds. And I could look at it and see what was the profile. And I'm not, I, I suspect it's going to be doing that same thing all the time. Well, you know, it's, uh, yeah, most of the time, 92% was in this state of waiting for this drift aware thread. Again, I don't think that's a big deal, but somebody else can take that up. If they think that's a big deal, take that up with the support folks. The bigger point I'm getting at is that I have not yet seen that be the cause of people's problems. Instead, I have seen that people's threads in the profiler, the CPU sampler, there's been some thread that they didn't understand. And when we profiled it, we said, whoa, look at what that's doing, okay? So it ties things together. You can profile individual things. You can sample um, CPUs while it's running. It's really good stuff. Um, anything else I wanted to say? Oh, you can take a snapshot. So the sampler has a feature where I just now said, okay, we'll track what's going on right now. And then again, I could wait some, you know, maybe a minute or something, and I could take another snapshot. And I'll just go ahead and click to take another snapshot. It's not important that I do that, but it says I can look at them here, but I can also click over here under profiler snapshots. And now I'm seeing those two snapshots I took and I can compare them. I can also look at them, but I'm gonna compare them to each other. So isn't that cool? And say, okay, well, in that time, what thread was using the most CPU time? <coughs> Excuse me, between those two times. Again, in our case, it's not that interesting, but in your case, it might jump out and tell you something very interesting. Somebody says, quick overview of the thread state, if you have time, of course. I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't focus on the thread states, but let me just get it out there since the person asked the question. So back on the CPU sampler, I don't know if it even, yeah, so there it is. They show the thread states. People think this is incredibly important from lots of digging into JVM stuff that they've done. I'm just gonna tell you in my experience, it's not that incredibly important. This is just the states that threads go through. Sometimes they're waiting, sometimes they're timed waiting, sometimes they're runnable, sometimes they're running. I'll show you if you're really interested in threads, if you come down here to resources, threads, this shows you all the threads in their current state and you can filter on it. So you could say, show me the running threads, show me the runnable threads, the timed waiting threads, the waiting threads and block threads. So if that stuff interests you, check it out. But I'm telling you, it's never been the solution to a problem I've helped people solve and I help people solve several problems a day. <laughs> and I've been doing it for 12 years with Fusion Reactor and I've never had to resort to focusing on the states of threads. I know some people think that's very important. Maybe I'm missing something, but it's never been necessary for me to pay attention to what the thread states were. But if you really like that, then again, I think this is in the ultimate edition under uh, resources is thread visualizer, thread visualizer. And this, shows you all the threads and their states over time. And it refreshes by default every second. And you can see here what threads are in what states over time. And you can see that they just go through different states. And so to me, you know, if I look at this, I don't go, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, you may, but I don't. You can stack trace the thread. So if that's interesting to you, you know, go ahead and check it out. And you might say, well, they added it as a feature. I agree. This is JVM low level stuff. And before we had a tool like Fusion Reactor that could just say what requests are running, what transactions are running, you had to resort to this really low level geeky stuff of what's the thread state in and how long has it been in that state and what if we stack trace it? What if we profile it? I'm just saying these are last resort things. You should almost always be able to solve your problems by looking at the requests information, the transactions information, and the JDBC information. Those are usually where your answers are gonna be. But I could argue this is like the fourth point of what you could look at in this part three of other unusual things. I, I could have added that, but to me, it's just not really valuable, but it may be valuable to you. So knock, knock yourself out if that's not interesting. But lastly, the next thing I wanna say, this is really interesting to most people is, well, what's going on in memory? Maybe my problem's memory. Now, before we go any further, I said in part one that Fusion Reactor shows you the heap use on the metrics web metrics page in the top right corner. And in my case, 
my heap uses 700 meg out of a gig. And you may have, you know, 5 gig or 50 gig of heap. It doesn't really matter what heap size you have. The question is, how much is it used relative to max? Now, before we go any further, like you could look at this and go, oh, Charlie, don't you worry? You're at 700 meg out of 900. Doesn't that mean you're about to run out of memory? And I said this back in part one and repeat it. No, I'm not necessarily worried. That may not be that it's truly using that memory. So the JVM for years has been inherently lazy. And if it feels like it's busy or if it feels like it's got available memory, it will be lazy about doing garbage collection. And I pointed out to you guys that Fusion Reactor can show you garbage collection. So I just want to repeat this for those who think memory is their problem. What usually you would think is your problem is garbage collection, and Fusion Reactor's got that under resources, garbage collection. And here we can see in the last minute, no, there's not much garbage collection going on. There's been one that took 50 milliseconds that released 100 meg of memory. But there's two kinds of GCs. The green ones are minor GCs. The blue ones are major, or scavenge and mark sweep. But the point is, the major ones don't happen that often. The minor ones happen all the time. If you notice it going up and down all the time, that's because usually it's these minor ones. And you can see that. I'm doing minors. This is within a minute. Well, let me switch out to an hour. And I'll get back to the memory analyzer in a moment. But before you dig into the memory analyzer, find out if you even have a memory problem at all. And there's two steps to it. One is, do you have a lot of GCs happening, yes or no? And, you know, I do, and that might even interest me, but that was like a half an hour ago. But more importantly, I want you to notice here, this is the number of them that have happened. And as I move along here, it's barely noticeable. And I have not had any majors. If I take this away and just am left with the majors, you can do that. I can do this up here too. Just show me the I haven't had any majors for the last hour. My JVM has decided, eh, I'm not that worried about it. Memories, I know we're getting close, but trust me, it's not a big deal. I'm not going to bother garbage collecting. If that's what's happening. You don't need to help the JVM. It knows what it's doing. But the point is, because it hasn't done a major GC, I know it said back on the metrics web metrics that I was using 700 meg out of, or yeah, 700 meg out of a gig. You might be showing, you know, 600 gig or six gig out of eight gig, and you might be thinking, oh, that's 80 percent. I got to worry. I'm saying, no, 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 no. If we just prove that it hasn't done any garbage collection, then this is not high use of memory. It's just lazily on garbage collected I use of memory and to prove it I'm going to click this button garbage collection and I know people freak out and think oh that's going to stop the server for minutes or seconds at a time isn't it well no it just ran and in my case it freed up 400 meg so I'm back down to only 285 meg so I'm at 285 out of a gig I'm definitely not worried now it did use some CPU it did maybe make requests take a couple hundred milliseconds longer for that moment that it ran for maybe a second or two. I'm not worried about that. The point is, I did this GC and it did drop like a rock. So I'm not using 800 meg out of my gig. And you may not be using the six gig out of your eight. So don't think just because it's high that there's a problem. If you GC it and it falls down, then it just was being lazy about garbage collection. And no, it doesn't need your help. You don't need to babysit it. You don't need to change JVM arguments. Don't worry about high memory unless you're getting out of memory concerns. But let's say, and here's now, let's bring it back to the profiler. Let's say I did GC it, and I'm forcing a major GC when I do that, and it stayed in my 800 meg. Well, that'd be different. If, it, if I did the GC and it stayed at 800 meg out of my gig, then I'd be a little more worried. I got 800 out of a gig. That's 80%. I might wonder, ooh, what's in there? But I want to be clear. I should GC it first and make sure it doesn't fall down because then I don't need to worry about it. But let's say it was 800 meg, and I was worried about it. Well, that's this last piece. It's called memory, and again, that's in the ultimate edition only, memory view heap, memory view heap. And if you've done any Java memory analysis with any of many available tools, this will look very familiar to you. It's just a web-based interface to doing heap analysis. And look what it's done. It said, okay, well, here's what objects are using the most memory right now. What type of objects? And it's usually this, bytes and cares and doubles and strings, which are not very interesting. And that may not be anything of use for me to do anything with it. But the point is, is that that's what they are. And remember, in my case, I'm only using a couple hundred meg. And so 93 meg of it is that and 28 meg of it is that. So these aren't big deal numbers. Your numbers may be very different. You may see some really unusual looking class that's using the most. But let me show you a couple things before we dig any further. First, this 
was that point in time. If I want to do it again, I could just take another snapshot. And when I take a snapshot, it saves that in memory snapshots. So I could also, I just took a snapshot. I could wait like a minute or an hour. And as long as my instance is not restarted, I could come along later, let's say an hour from now and take another snapshot. And then I could compare them. So I'm just gonna quickly do it just to show you that it can be done. And so now I've got two and I could click here to view them or I could go to memory, heap snapshots. But I'm looking at that particular one. If I look at heap snapshots, now here's both of them. And again, I can compare them. And so I could say, all right, well in that, you know, it was about a 40 seconds, it's not that big a deal. But in those 40 seconds, where was the difference? What, what created more stuff on the one versus the other? And if I wanted to reverse the order, I could reverse the order. And so we're talking about, in my case, the 951.23 and the 951.00, right? So this is more like on the right is what's now, on the left is what was earlier. That's the way to look at it. And so what went up was bytes. Again, this is not interesting to me, but you might see something very different, some particular kind of class that's rising significantly. And if it were some caching or uh, some other internal object that you're loading as a component or an object, you might see that object name. All right, so that's that. One other thing I'll show you about the live memory view that people miss, and it might be interesting for you. So I'm just backing up to where I was looking at the live display of memory. Okay, so, and again, it would have just been heap, view, heap, but this is it. First of all, if you're interested, you can search this. So if you thought there was some caching issue, you could type C-A-C-H. And if there was some caching related object that was using up memory, you know, there's E-H cache stuff there and they're not big, you know, this is small percentages, so I'm not too worried about it, but you might, find that it's interesting to you and you might want to dig into it. Okay, so that's one thing. You can search for particular kinds of things if that interests you. You can also force a GC and I would recommend you do that. You know, when you're coming to look at this and you're thinking, okay, I need to know what's going on right now. Do a GC so that what you're looking at is what you're really using right now. And that shouldn't take long. I know people don't think they should do this, but it shouldn't take long. Anyway, the point is you're trying to do diagnostics and you want to know what's going on right now. That's what you do, you click that button. And then finally, one more thing, whether I've done the find or not, if I'm looking at this heap histogram, this memory view heap, there's also a feature here to, first I'll tell you, you can try to look at them if you can, but sometimes it won't decompile. But there's this thing over here, which is actually called GC roots. And if I click on this, it'll take up to a couple of seconds and try to figure out what were those things pointing to. Actually, it took a second. At what was pointing to that? And it said, I didn't find anything after a second. Now, each of those attempts to do something does take some time. It's like a GC, it takes time. It can stop other requests from running. So they don't wanna spend a lot of time doing that. But if you wanna tell it, I wanna take a little longer, you can just click here and say, okay, well, take up to two seconds this time. See if you can find anything after two seconds. So I've clicked, I thought I'd click it. There you go. And it did finally find something and it's just a little more detail about that request. And I could keep, digging into its roots or I could keep trying to find other roots. I just I don't have time to get into that now. This was just an overview of these features. We've done other talks about the details of all these features in the past. And one other thing I want to point out, and this is important that you hear, there is online documentation for Fusion Reactor. So if you come up here to the top left corner to Fusion Reactor help, Fusion Reactor top left corner is a button, help. And that opens a new tab in your browser. And that takes you to the online docs. And there are many manuals in the online docs. And again, I've just got some network issue because this should come up in less than a second. And it, you'll see on the left that there are multiple documents. And one of them is the Fusion Reactor user guide. And now I'm starting to wonder if that's an issue on their server too, because I've not seen it take this long ever. Um, could it be happening momentarily? Anyway, since I'm on Fusion Reactor 7.4, note it took me to the 7.4 docs. I'm just gonna refresh this one more time. Oh, there you go. So there's the introduction to the docs. And then over here, these are the different manuals. And for what we're talking about, it would be in the user guide. And if I expand that, I can see the various buttons that were on the left. And look, there's memory. 
So I can learn more about this by going to memory, view, heap, or GC roots. There's a whole discussion of GC roots. So you can click on that and read about that. That's my point is just to say, don't feel like you have to know this stuff. Don't feel like you have to Google to find out what this stuff means. The docs are often very substantial. And again, I don't know why this is being so slow to come up. It's usually instant. But you'll see that it talks about GC roots. I got to move on because we're running out of time. All right. So we've seen features that helped us when the ones covered in parts one and two don't. We've seen stack tracing to see what's going on in request right now. We saw profiling to see what's gone. Mostly we want to look at it for requests that have been run in the past. You could also look at ones that are running now. It might be helpful. The CPU sampler, what threads of whatever type, requests or otherwise, are using CPU and why? You can stack trace those. And then the memory profiler, which lets us look at what objects are using the most heap. And it's mostly a Java perspective of things, which can sometimes be hard to connect back to CFML, but sometimes it won't be. So anyway, read more about that in the docs. And if you have questions on any of this stuff, you can send to the support folks. I'll give you the email address in just a moment. So remember, this was part three of a series. Two, four weeks ago, we did what happened on my server. Two weeks ago, we did why requests running slowly and today. And then next time, two weeks from now, post-crash troubleshooting. These three things are great when the CF, for instance, you're looking at is up, but post-crash troubleshooting is when it's gone down. Don't worry, you can still leverage Fusion Reactor. It's got logs, archive metrics, alerts, and Fusion Reactor Cloud's got alerts and profiling. So we'll go over those in part four. That'll be the end of this series. And you can watch all these recordings all the ones that we've done in the past, you can go to fusion-reactor.com slash webinars and watch them all. There's about now 18 of them. And they're all different. They're not this, you know, nothing's repeated. They're all 18 different talks on different subjects in different depth about each of those subjects. And I want to make that point is that these four parts have just been an overview of troubleshooting with Fusion Reactor of certain key features. There are many, many others that we haven't covered or that we go into in more depth because they're worthy of that depth. I know that this stuff is not always easy to connect the dots and figure out. But again, my goal here was to lead you through the city of Fusion Reactor, and we've just spent time in one museum looking at the cool things that museum has, and maybe you might want to come back and look at that museum more on your own, to use my city tour analogy. But these were the key ones that you need to do your typical troubleshooting. That was the point. So do see those other 15 webinars available there. If you do have further questions, I've pointed out that the docs are available on the website. You can download Fusion Manager, get the update. You can watch videos, see tech notes. There's forums, mailing lists, groups, things like that, chat, uh, Twitter feeds. You can email the folks at sales or support <clears throat> at fusionreactor.com, depending on what your question is. And sales questions, you can call them at that number. And both these are offered on the top right corner of the website. So if you ever forget this, just go to the Fusion Reactor website, look at the top right corner, and you've got the email addresses and the phone number there. And then finally, for consulting assistance, they have a sister site called cfconsultant.com, and it's offered at the bottom of the website. It's a link to it. And that you can hire consulting from Integral, and often they'll pass it to me. So anyway, um, we do look forward to your feedback on this webinar, other webinars we've done, anything you'd like to see that we haven't done, just let us know. And there we go, right at the top of the hour. I've been watching the questions. I haven't seen any more questions since the ones earlier. So does anybody have any right now? We've got a minute or two before I stop the recording. pricing of the Ultimate Edition, you can find that on the Fusion Reactor website. So let me just show you that really quick. It's, it's definitely worth knowing about. Uh, if I go, where's the browser? There you go. If I go to fusion-reactor.com, that's a natural question that you would have about uh, how much are the different ones and what are the features the different ones has. It's really important to see that. And remember the stack tracing is in all of them. The other three do happen to be an ultimate. And if you look here at the front page of the website, these are all drop down menus. And if I look at compare on prem editions, again, we'll talk a little bit next week, next time about cloud, but you can read more about cloud later. But here's compare on prem editions. And this page will show you which ones, which features are in ultimate, which features are in enterprise, and which ones are in standard. And then there's the pricing too. So it's 39 a month for standard, 59 for enterprise. 79 for ultimate. 
So it's not too big of a difference, $40 a month difference. These are the key things that are in Ultimate. We haven't in this set of troubleshooting focused on the debugger. We've had other presentations on the debugger. This is a new feature in eight event snapshots. I'll leave you to look into that. And then the profiler is what we were talking about today, the um, doing the profiling of requests, threads, the memory profiler we saw. Um, thread profiling, they're similar to that and that. I don't know why they're separate points. And there's the CPU sampler that we saw today. And then the enterprise dashboard is in enterprise, as are the JMX metrics. We haven't talked about that, but I did it in previous talks. And logging capture. So I'll leave you to explore these things. And then by far, most of the features are in all three editions. So anyway, you can come back and read about that. And each one of these that's got a blue box, you can click to learn more. So let me just tell you quickly, if you haven't seen the archive viewer, check that out. That's new in 7.2. And we'll talk about that in part four as one of the four things that we'll talk about in part four. Do you plan to upload a recorded version of part two of the series? Uh, are you saying you don't see the recording of part two of the series? So let me show you if we go to support webinars, support webinars, or if you just Google Fusion Reactor webinars, you'll find it. And it's literally just fusion-reactor.com slash webinars. So here's today's part three that you could register for. Here's part four that you could register for. Here's part one. Oh, did they not get part two up? Oh, goodness. Thank you, Nerthen. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know why they hadn't posted that. They should have done that two weeks ago when I did it. So I do apologize on their behalf that they never got around to doing that. So if anybody from Integral is listening, they always listen to the recordings and edit them to take out the stuff at the beginning, you know, that was just getting started, that sort of stuff. And then they package it up and they post it. And I will say, oh, by the way, I hear somebody getting on, but let me just say, I bet if you look in YouTube, it's there already. But anyway, was that Jenna or somebody else wanting to answer? Uh, the yes, question? Uh, we will upload it as soon as possible. Thank you for pointing that out. And I apologize that it's not yeah. there yet. Thank you, ma'am. So yeah, they're great about that. All right. So uh, thank you. <laughs> yep. So you'll be able to watch that. And by the way, Jenna, do you know if it's already on YouTube, even though it's not here? Or is it not yet on YouTube either? Um, I am not totally sure about yeah, sure. that. Okay. I okay. can. But both can check. I can. That's okay. I just wanted to yeah. do. That's all right. Yeah, it so will be very soon out. there. Sure. Yeah. So that's the, the way that the process works is they do that little bit of editing if needed, and then they create a version that they put on YouTube, and then they point to that from here. So they could have done the one step of putting it on YouTube and forgotten to do the second step of pointing to it from here. But they'll take care. Of it. Thank you again. Um, for bringing part two. Part two and, is on our YouTube channel. There you go. So that's the point. They did already put it up, but you wouldn't know that necessarily. Although if you did look at any of these and moused over it, you'd see that when you clicked on it, it took you to a uh, YouTube video ultimately to start playing it. So, you know, anyway, check it out on YouTube and there you go. All right. So with that, I don't see any other questions. Let's try to end this so we're staying around an hour and thanks everybody for coming. And we'll see you in two weeks with the talk on post crash troubleshooting. So we're wrap up the series until then. See you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Charlie. Good, man.